after this specific example, I would like to show you the general procedure, how you go about solving problems in cl of classical mechanics in the Lagrangian formalism. And the general procedure consists of eight steps in total. Well, it's like a recipe and you can, whenever you encounter a problem in classical mechanics, you can really work uh, along these eight steps. The first step is that you look carefully at the constraints in the system. In the previous example, we had um, the mass constrained to move on this inclined plane. And this led to the fact that the, in, this, in that example, the system had one effective degree of freedom only, rather than two. And also you do the same for a general problem, you look at the constraints and you consider how many effective degrees of freedom you have in the system. And this is something that we, I, would, I will come back to um, very shortly after, this, after I outline this general procedure, I will come back to the issue of constraints and degrees of freedom. Next, taking into account these constraints, you pick suitable coordinates. So you find suitable coordinates, and one generally likes to um, denote these coordinates by QI. They're sometimes also called uh, generalized coordinates. And they don't have to be Cartesian, they can be angles and arbitrary curvilinear coordinates that are suitable for the problem at hand. And these coordinates, they will be related to Cartesian coordinates in some way, by some transformation rule. And so they will be related to the Cartesian coordinates. Let me call these x, j, for example, via some transformation law that reads x, j, is some function of the new coordinates, qi, and possibly this relationship between the new coordinates and the Cartesian coordinates may also be time dependent. You may think of a rotating frame, for example, so the coordinate in the rotating frame, this say this is your new coordinates that you find suitable for the problem at hand, is related to the Cartesian coordinates in the rest frame, in the, in the initial frame, um, via some transformation that is time dependent, uh, because the frame rotates. So this is allowed. You can have an arbitrary transformation law, and it may depend on time. As for the notation, the Generalized coordinates, as I already said, are usually denoted by Q, and the X, XI, are usually reserved for Cartesian coordinates. Next, you write down the Lagrange function. So you determine the Lagrangian as a function of the new coordinates, so of the Q, Q dot, and T. The Lagrange function is the difference of kinetic energy and potential energy. <clears throat> the kinetic energy, you know what the formula is for the kinetic energy in Cartesian coordinates. Cartesian coordinates, it's simply a function of the velocities, function of the xi dot. But using the transformation rule from the previous point, um, you express these velocities, xi dot, in terms of the new coordinates. So you express these in terms of um, q, q dot, and possibly also explicitly time. And in doing so, you turn the kinetic energy into a function of the new coordinates. And you have to subtract from that the potential energy, u, which in Cartesian coordinates is um, a function 
of position. But now you express this Cartesian coordinate again using the previous uh, transformation rule. You express that as a function of q and t. And at the end, you have the Lagrange function expressed as a function of the new coordinates and the new velocities. This is step number three. Step number four, once you have the Lagrange function, you can write down the Euler-Lagrange equation. Yeah, so you can write down Euler-Lagrange. That says d over dt, and then you have dl partial dqi dot minus dl partial dqi. This is equal to zero for all i. So here you have immediately the equation of motion in the new coordinates. So what I mentioned earlier as the, the big practical advantage of the Lagrange formalism is that if you proceed in this way, it gives you immediately the equation of motion in your chosen coordinates. You don't have to start with the equation of motion in Cartesian coordinates and then labor hard to transform these equations of motion into the new coordinates. But the sort of the uh, transition to the new coordinates already happens in the definition of the Lagrange function. So you, all you do is that in the kinetic energy and in the potential energy you express the velocities, the Cartesian velocities and the Cartesian position in terms of the new coordinates. And then you immediately have the Lagrange function as a function of the new coordinates and the resultant Euler-Lagrange equation is immediately the correct equation of motion in the new coordinates. Yeah? So there's no need to transform equations of motion. <laughs> this is number four. Once you have the equation of motion, then of course you want to proceed to solve it. And from here on, the steps are similar to the steps that we took in Newtonian mechanics we should look for conserved quantities and exploit these conservation laws if possible. We have to determine integration constants, relate them to initial conditions, and then finally discuss the result physically. And so next step, determine conserved quantities. Here too, I would like to um, add some more details later on today how you do that once you have conserved quantities if they exist um, then you proceed to solve the equation of motion using these conservation laws if possible so you write down the um, general solution for your equation of motion this general solution will contain integration constants and you want to relate these integration constants to initial conditions of your problem. So you relate integration constants to initial conditions and then finally, as in the Newtonian case, you should not forget to discuss the solution physically, what it means. These are the eight steps that you generally should follow to solve a problem in the Lagrange formalism. And we can um, just check mentally if we followed these steps in our simple example of the inclined plane. Step number one, we, we did consider the fact that the mass is constrained to move on the surface of that inclined plane and the fact that we had only one degree of freedom, effectively. We did use that. And we exploited that fact in our choice of coordinates. We said there's just a single parameter that describes the position of our mass, that's this parameter S, and that was our new coordinate. 
we wrote down the relationship between the Cartesian coordinates x and y and this new parameter s. So step number two. We wrote down the Lagrange function and we determined the Lagrange function as a function of our new coordinate s and the velocity s dot. And we did it exactly in this way that's written down here. We took the kinetic energy in Cartesian coordinates, inserted the transformation law, and we took the potential energy and simply uh, inserted the transformation law. Then we moved on, wrote down the Euler-Lagrange equation. Um, and at that point, we actually stopped after step number four. Later on, we will come back to the inclined plane and add some of the steps that are still missing. Then I would like to come back to the first issue, the issue of constraints. That's sort of a very um, important point, very important issue in Lagrangian mechanics, and it merits a bit of attention. There are different kinds of constraints. I will explain in a minute what they are. And I would like to focus on constraints that are called holonomic constraints. We look at motion that is uh, subject to some constraint. For example, look at a motion in two dimensions say, on the surface of the Earth. There's an object moving, and the object is a locomotive, and the motion of that locomotive is constrained to railway tracks. So effectively, the motion of the locomotive is not two-dimensional, but it's only one-dimensional. This is very similar to the example we just had, the inclined plane. There too, the motion, even though it took place in two dimensions, was constrained effectively to a one-dimensional line. We can consider this in a more general fashion. We can consider motion that, in principle, could take place in a higher dimensional space, can be two-dimensional, three-dimensional, or if you have uh, many particles, then mathematically then each particle can move in a three-dimensional space. Uh, so to characterize the position of all, say, n particles, you need three n coordinates. So you could say that this n particle system moves in a three n-dimensional space. <coughs> And then constraints are such that effectively the motion of the system, however, is constrained to some sub-manifold of this high dimensional space. So more generally, we consider motion um, that is constrained to some lower dimensional sub-manifold of the so-called configuration space. Now, constraints of that type, where the motion is constrained to some submanifold, constra constraints of that type are called holonomic constraints. These constraints will be our focus here. Now, what are constraints that are not holonomic? Consider a particle inside a box. Yeah, so you have a particle inside a box. Now the particle inside the box, it can take any position. So inside the box, the motion of the particle is allowed to take place in all three dimensions. The constraint is simply that the, the particle is not allowed to leave the box. It's constrained to stay inside the box. Or more generally, you can think of sort of a higher dimensional configuration space and the system is constrained to stay within some region inside this configuration space. 
this would be a kind of constraint that is non-holonomic. When you, when you look at these two examples, in the, in the example of the particle constrained to a region inside this cube, then of course the inside of the cube is also a submanifold of the entire three-dimensional space. So it's also a submanifold, but the key point is it's not a lower dimensional submanifold. So I should underline here this is, a, this is an important ingredient that holonomic constraints are constraints that effectively reduce the dimensionality of the problem. So that's a necessary condition for constraints to be holonomic is that they um, reduce motion to a submanifold that has a lower dimensional than the original configuration space. Then I would like to talk about how you can take such constraints into account when you choose coordinates. How that affects your choice of coordinates. I already talked about degrees of freedom. Let me give a more formal definition for that um, word, degrees of freedom. I also give it a letter F. This is the number of degrees of freedom. And this is simply the dimension of the submanifold to which the motion is constrained. Now let's consider the general situation where we have n mass points. Then if they are all allowed to move freely, each mass point can move in three dimensions. And so the configuration of this collection of mass points is specified by three n coordinates. Three for each particle. So the um, 3n is the dimension of our full configuration, configuration space, without any constraints. Now we have constraints which constrain the motion of our system to a submanifold of this 3n dimensional uh, configuration space. And that submanifold has dimension f. And f is strictly smaller than 3n. So this is the dimension of the allowed submanifold. The reduction from three, dimension 3n to dimension f is affected by 3n minus f independent constraint equations. And these ex constraint equations can all be written in the form it's some function f1 which depends on all the positions of all the particles involved. Some function of these um, positions must vanish. This is one constraint. And then we can have another function f2 and so on. And in total we have 3n minus f functions of the positions of the particles involved which must vanish. And this is also a more formal way of um, defining and introducing holonomic constraints that you say um, you have a certain number of independent constraint equations in this form and this effectively reduces the allowed configuration space from dimension 3n to dimension f. <coughs> Let me give you an example to make this a little bit more concrete. Let's consider a simple, a single mass which is constrained to move on the surface of a sphere. Let's say the sphere has radius capital R. Can this constraint be expressed in the form that I noted above? That some function of the position vanishes. So you can say that um, if the position of the particle, say here is the origin, position vector of the particle 
is the vector little r. And then you can define a function f1 of the position vector. You can define it as position vector squared minus the radius of the sphere squared. And the function defined in this way must be equal to zero. So the, the position of the single particle is constrained to, to those posi positions where this function vanishes. So much about degrees of freedom and uh, constraint equations. And now let's think about how you would choose coordinates under such constraints. Physically, you can imagine constraints to be the, the, the limiting case of a very steep potential in the following sense. Let's go back to this uh, railway track. Yeah, so here you have your, your railway track. The train, the locomotive, is constrained to move on this railway track. And one way to describe it is you could say you define on this x1, x2 plane, you define a potential. When you have a potential like that, a body will tend to move near the minimum of this potential. Um, and when you make this potential steeper and steeper, so you go from the uh, blue form to, to this form, say, so you make this potential steeper and steeper so until it becomes a very narrow uh, valley, then effectively the motion of the system is constrained to this one-dimensional submanifold in this case. What you would like to do, what you would want to aim at, is that also in your mathematical description of the motion, in your equation of motion at the end, you, you have a smaller number of coordinates and you have a smaller number of equations of motion that you have to solve. If you do it in Newtonian mechanics, here you would have an equation of motion for the x1 component, for the x2 component, but motion is effectively one-dimensional, so you would like to have one coordinate only, and at the end you want to have one equation of motion only, in which this one coordinate features. So we did, you would like to eliminate the second coordinate. So what you would do in this case, starting from this two-dimensional plane and the railway track, you would choose one coordinate Q1 which goes along parallel to the railway track and a second coordinate Q2 which is perpendicular to that. So you can, with this choice of coordinates, you can express the constraint very simply as saying Q2 is equal to zero. Yeah? So when I go from the coordinates x1, x2 to the generalized coordinates q1, q2, then I, in these generalized coordinates I can express the constraint on this track simply as q2 is equal to zero. And the other coordinate, q1, may vary freely. And this is the, generalized, uh, the general idea when you have constraints. You try to find coordinates such that the constraint can be expressed simply as some of these coordinates being equal to zero and all the other coordinates are allowed to take arbitrary values. So we have two kinds of coordinates here. We can classify coordinates and let's denote this now for the general case where we have n particles, each particle can uh, take a position in three-dimensional space. So we have three n Cartesian coordinates and when we do a coordinate transformation in full configuration space, 
then we still need 3n coordinates, generalized coordinates, qi. So i goes from 1 to 3n. But the idea is that we choose the coordinates such that we have two kinds, two types. There's one type of coordinate, and let's say these are the coordinates q1 to qf, where f is the number of degrees of freedom. These are the coordinates of type 1. And these are allowed to vary freely. And then we have another kind of coordinate. These are the remaining coordinates from f plus 1 up to 3n. And you see these are 3n minus f coordinates. These are the coordinates of type 2. And they are constrained to being zero. So these are all zero. Let's come back to our example of the single particle moving on the surface of a sphere. Remember the general situation. We have a sphere x, y, z. We have a single particle constrained to move on the surface of the sphere. Remember that the constraint was um, r squared minus radius of the sphere squared, or in components, this is x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus radius of the sphere squared is equal to zero. And now we choose new coordinates. I propose the following choice. We go from Cartesian coordinates x, y, z. We go to a kind of spherical coordinates, very similar to spherical coordinates. Um, we have the two angles, theta and phi, that we know from spherical coordinates. And then, as the last coordinate, we don't take the radius, as, usually, uh, as is usually done for spherical coordinates but we take the difference of um, little r, which is the distance of the particle from the origin, minus the radius of the sphere. So these are new, our new generalized coordinates, theta phi and little r minus capital R. The first two are allowed to vary freely. Uh, we, have, we can have arbitrary angles because we can have an arbitrary position on the surface of the sphere. So these two coordinates, these two angles, they constitute the coordinates of type 1. The third coordinate, little r minus capital R, is constrained to be equal to 0 because yeah, the particle must be on the surface of the sphere. The distance from the origin must equal the radius of the sphere. So uh, this coordinate here uh, is constrained to be zero and is therefore a coordinate of type 2. Now what we are aiming at is that the coordinates of type 2 we can eventually forget. And we can describe the problem entirely with coordinates of type 2. One. And then in comparison to the Cartesian case, we just have f of them rather than 3n of them. And that's the simplification. We are not yet uh, quite there where we can simply say, oh, just forget about type 2 coordinates. That requires a little bit of justification. And I'd like to just um, give you a plausibility argument why you can do that. Let's have a look at the Euler-Lagrange equations for the dynamics in these new generalized coordinates. Well, we have Euler-Lagrange equations for all the new coordinates that we introduced. We have Euler-Lagrange equa equations both for the type 2 coordinates and for the type 1 coordinates. Let's start with the type 2 coordinates. And the Euler-Lagrange equations read... Uh, d over dt, and then we have the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to q dot, and now q is of type 2. 
minus partial dl dq of type 2 is equal to 0. Now here the, the idea comes into play that we can understand constraints as a limiting case of a very steep potential. In that limiting case, the solution of that Euler-Lagrange equation for the type 2 coordinates will be simply coordinate and velocity equal to zero. Okay. So in the limit of an infinitely steep potential, we will have a solution where the type 2 coordinate and also the velocity associated with the type 2 coordinate are equal to zero. And this is a form of conservation law. Now we can turn our attention to the Euler-Lagrange equation for the type 1 coordinates. They read as follows, same structure, d over dt. Then we have the partial of the Lagrangian. And here I would like to make explicit the fact that the Lagrangian at this point still depends on all the coordinates and all the velocities including type 2. So I would like to write this explicitly, the Lagrangian depends on coordinates type 1, coordinates type 2, velocities type 1, velocities type 2, and possibly explicitly on time. Now we have the partial with respect to q dot type 1 minus partial of L and again I make this explicit and T dq1 is equal to 0. At this point of course we can use the result from the previous equation of motion so the fact that the coordinates and the velocities of type 2 are all equal to 0 and we can insert this here and we can define a new, co uh, a new Lagrange function L star a new Lagrange function which now depends only on the type 1 coordinates we can define it in the following way it's the original Lagrange function which depends on all the coordinates but we set the type 2 coordinates equal to 0 and the type 2 velocities equal to 0. Yeah, so we, we introduce formally a new Lagrange function which depends on type 1 coordinates only. And then we get an, an equation of motion with this new Lagrange function so dl star over dqi dot minus partial l star coordinate type 1 equal to 0. And in this equation of motion, the type 2 coordinates uh, no longer appear. And in this sense, you may forget about the type 2 coordinates.